Thank you very much, Lucy, and uh, thank you very much for the invitation to be part of this great webinar series. I mean, looking at all of the talks that were before, it's really tough uh, to be on the same level. I'll try to give it my best. Um, as Lucy said, I'll talk about the role of coastal adaptation during evolution, particularly the question, what might be the big deal about this? And uh, this topic really has been part of my academic career since 10 years. Uh, I've did my undergraduate on something along these lines, as I will show in a bit. So um, kind of like also for me, looking back at the last uh, 10 years of part, at least of my research. Um, first of all, I'll always like to start with uh, thinking about us and humans today. And obviously, I mean, for me, at least, if I see these pictures here of beautiful coasts and beaches and so on, it always gives me a good feeling for sure. And, and not just me, I bet here, particularly in the current British and also the German uh, rainy weather. Um, well, tourism obviously is a big thing with coasts. Many people like to go to coasts, enjoy the oceans, and many of us also enjoy the foods that you get there from mussels to oysters to what you can have lobsters and so on and so on. So this is kind of like this shallow or modern time perspective um, on that. At the same time, also, um, there's this other connection of humans today with many of us, actually, uh, more than 600 million people on the earth living in coastal areas, particularly also in certain uh, so called coastal mega cities. Those are cities larger, more than 10 million people, like Manila or Jakarta, and also others. And also, actually, if you look at people living relatively close to the ocean, so around 100 kilometers away, those are almost 2.4 billion people. So obviously, there is this modern kind of connection between humans and the coasts and the oceans. Um, but here, we're not interested in the modern kind of sense, right? But we're interested in how deep does this relation between humans, hominins, and the coasts and oceans reach back? And I try. I would like to start with a, actually a historical point of view, so to speak, because almost 15 years ago, 50 years ago, the geographer Carl Sauer had some ideas about the seashore being the potential primitive home of man, where he said actually the discovery of the sea, whenever it happened, might have been kind of like the initial starting point of our illusion, where he says says even no other setting is as attractive for the beginnings of humanity. Um, and it's not just about you know the coast maybe being our birth or origin place, he even goes further and saying something about human dispersals, where he says, the dispersal of early men took place most readily by following along the seashore, the coasts ahead presented familiar foods and habitats. So you see, I, I just picked out this one thing, because also it's nice and 50 years ago and, and very direct on our topic, that for some people, also in the past, the coast did play a role for the antiquity or the evolution of our species. This is actually a bit special coming from the 60s, because if you look at other research being done in the 1960s and 1990s, actually, most scholarship at that time, when looking at the places and use of coasts, said, well, actually, looking at coastal ecosystems, they are rather barriers for human movement. Many of those coasts, like desert coasts or so, might actually be uninhabitable. They saw them rather as marginal ecosystems compared to most inland ecosystems. Um, so in a general sense, unattractive. So those are all quotes from several kind of works in 96, 1990s. And when it came to kind of like the Pleistocene use of coast, um, many scholars said, well, actually, they're devoid of any evidence of early humans. And so they might ultimately be irrelevant to our story. So very different to what Carl Sauer said. And I like this quote by Mayhem from 1969 on the bottom that also kind of exemplifies this idea where he says, the average Molluscan flesh is certainly not very appealing in appearance, and the earliest humans apparently existed for uncounted millennia before that anonymous hero ate the first oyster. In any event, shell middens of real antiquity are rare or absent in world archaeology. So this is kind of setting the stage showing that actually for much of human evolutionary research, the coast didn't play a big role, at least for this deep time perspective Pleistocene, so before the Holocene. Before I go a bit deeper into why it does maybe matter in current research, I quickly want to provide you with some definition because I'll talk about coastal adaptation today. I first have to tell you what, what I mean with coasts. It's not actually that easy to define coasts or shores because they're generally dynamic, right? This is the dynamic interface between marine and terrestrial ecosystems. And you all know that in the Pleistocene, but also to, still today, there are global sea level fluctuations with transgressions and regressions obviously changing how much sure there is or where the coast even is, right? Um, but if you have one coast at a certain kind of time slice, we, in one of our papers, because we need a kind of definition, define the coast as an approximately 500 meter strip of land along the shoreline. So 
if you define it like that, certainly the shore or the, the ocean is always in vision and you have easy direct access to the ocean. And we define the so-called near coastal zone of about a 30 kilometer radius around the ocean. That's actually not our definition, but um, much of a lot of the ethnographic data shows that hunter gatherers generally use marine resources up to at least 10 kilometers inside, meaning they transport, for example, shellfish also to inland sites up to 10 kilometers. So that's how we kind of like define these kind of, of boundaries. And I'll talk mostly about these kind of areas. I already mentioned that what is really important to understand the deep time coasts and coastal adaptations is that um, there are millennial changes in sea level and they influence the exact locations of coastlines, right? Here's the example of the South or Southern African coastline where you can see that in glacial times like MIS-6 or Marine Osotope Stage 2, they actually the modern coastlines were not the coastlines back then, but there was a large stretch of land uh, that we don't see anymore because it's flooded nowadays. Um, but we should always keep that in mind, right? I mean, sea level change certainly influenced um, what kinds of sites we even see nowadays, right? And many sites that might have well been there in the Pleistocene are now below the surface of, uh, of the ocean, right? It's just important to keep in mind and we'll come back a bit later to that and how, that, how much that distorts our evidence. I also have to define uh, what coastal adaptation or coastal adaptations are. Most often in the particularly older literature, you see it as a, a singular, I normally use it as a plural. Um, most people have defined coastal adaptations based on ethnographic evidence from hunter-gatherers using the coast, where they say you, the coastal adaptations are the use of coastlines where they, people spend a significant proportion of the year at the coast. They use syst uh, marine foods in a systematic and regular way, and the marine foods um, reflect the largest proportion of the diet. And this kind of behavior results in you know, large shell mittens that you know for much of, also prehistory in many in the Americas, but also in Europe, for example. Some people went even further for Beaton, for example, and also for Curtis Marin, who's relevant in this talk. Um, coastal adaptation includes year-round settlements on or near shorelines, systematic acquisition of marine foods, and even an, a transformation of the overall behavior of people in relation to the sea and its resources. And you can see, particularly from the second kind of um, definition, this seems to be a relatively black and white distinction, right? You either have a coastal adaptation or you don't. And um, when I came into this topic 10 years ago, I was already not really happy with these kinds of definitions. I think they might be okay to quantify or qualify modern or recent data, but I don't think these kinds of black and white definitions help us a lot when we think about deep time engagement of various hominins with the coasts, and there might be you know, gradual differences. And so I wasn't really happy looking at this, and that's why we, um, we came up with a different kind of uh, definition. We called it the Evolutionary definition we uh, proposed in 2016, where we say, well, we should take the word adaptation seriously when we talk about coastal adaptations. So um, for us, coastal adaptations are a, kind of like a, a polyphatic set of adaptive behavioral traits that include mostly two things. Um, one being the regular and systematic use of marine food resources with an active acquisition. Think about shellfish, think about seals, think about marine birds. Um, so this excludes, for example, simply scavenging or opportunistic use of these resources, but also this is, should be coupled with a systematic occupation of coastal ecosystems instead of simply, for example, hominins traversing these areas, which they've done particularly quite early already. Um, and this, I would say, also allows for a grayscale, right? You might be more or less adapted to the coast, that might depend, I mean, you can look at that in a quantitative way, but it's not a black and white distinction either the population that has it or doesn't have it. I mean, I'll use that definition in this talk, but we can certainly talk about that one um, in the Q&A session. So what's the big deal now, right? It's in my title. I say, well, there might be, for some people, it might be a big deal. And I brought you something from a, from a South African homepage, humanorigin.co.za, um, where it states Mossel Bay, point of human origins and awakening the human spirit you're looking from pinnacle point outside to the indian ocean um and yeah for some people coastal adaptations are a real big thing there's also this uh, scientific american article by curtis um, curtis marion with the title when the sea saved humanity and ideas here that it's really key to understand human origins so our homo sapiens origins um key to that is the use of coastlines and oceans so that might be a big thing, right? I mean, at least it's out there. And to summarize the discussions, I would say that in the last 20 years or so, there has been a lot of research focus um, on of Middle Stone Age archaeology, for example, on the potential role of coastal adaptations on our biocultural evolution. It kind of like goes two ways. 
Um, the first idea being that, well, if people adapt to the coast, it includes a novel subsistence strategy with certain dietary implications because you add a new kind of food resource. Um, I'll give you two examples in a second about this model. The one connects marine foods to brain evolution and the other by Curtis Marion to the emergence of Homo sapiens. But there's also a second thread of discussion being that um, for sure, if you settle on coasts, that includes an expansion of your settlement system to also include these kinds of coastal ecosystems. And potentially, as already Carl Sauer said, but also other people that you can see here cited, this might have facilitated particularly rapid dispersals out of Africa along coastlines. And I'll talk quickly about that as well. So one model, um, which I call the brain hypothesis, sees a close co-evolution of the consumption of marine foods and the appearance of human cognition. That goes actually back particularly to a paper in 2002 of both biochemists and nutritional scientists, but also psychologists, most namely uh, John Parking has been key here, but there's also even a book on this now. And I'll try to explain this in a nutshell very quickly. So um, marine foods, for example, shellfish, but also fish, they have a really high proportion of so-called brain selective nutrients. This includes, for example, long chain polyunsaturated omega fatty acids that you all know probably from, from advertisements, television and so on, but also other uh, elements like zinc, iodine, copper and so on. And the cool thing about marine foods is that they are really rich in those um, nutrients, whereas most Inland animals don't have so much of that in their meat, for example. In egg yolk has a high uh, amount of these brain selective nutrients, but many resources don't have that. And now, and that's quite interesting, there are many medical and nutritional studies that looked at what, what happens if you consume many of these brain selective nutrients. Well, first of all, you need them generally mostly for the maintenance and growth of brain tissue. Um, and there were many medical studies that showed if you have more of them, so the positive function are, for example, that you have higher executive functions, learning abilities, and so on. But maybe even more interesting is that if you lack, if you have an, if a deficiency of these nutrients, there are many detrimental effects on brain development. And it even goes so far that they are associated with, for example, reduced memory, high risk for depression, or even schizophrenia, right? So that might, and if you take that together, the kind of like, this is a new diet and this has positive effects, um, then some people said, well, actually, maybe with the emergence of an increase in the use of uh, marine foods, um, that could have driven or even caused, you know, modern human uh, brain development and civilization and so on. For example, John Parkinson has claimed so, and he associated these kinds of uh, potential cognitive trends with the high amount of complex material culture you see particularly in the coastal MSA sites of Southern Africa. So this is kind of this model in a nutshell. And importantly, these brain select nutrients are most important for um, pregnant women and children because it's growing the brain tissue, right? So particularly in those uh, demographies, it would be super important to have enough of these nutrients. That's one of the models, how um, coastal adaptations could impact human evolution. There's another model by Curtis Marion, I'll quickly dub that the coastal cradle model that says, well, actually, coastal adaptations were instrumental in the emergence of our species, so the biological emergence of Homo sapiens, um, where, and that's again in a nutshell, very simplified here, where he claims that um, in marine isotope stage six, which was a really cold kind of period, a glacial period, um, the southern African coastline or coast ecosystem was an ideal refugee for. Um, for Homo sapiens to kind of like, or even like isolated populations that maybe then became Homo sapiens by also providing all kinds of foods, particularly coastal resources or marine foods, kind of like as a buffer against, for example, the, the, the shortages in other resources. And that might have led to Southern Africa being the birthplace of our species. This is really simplified, but it's kind of a model that came from him in a couple of um, papers since 2011. And that would be a big deal then if that would be true. There's also another implication on dispersing out of Africa. Chris Stringer called this in 2000, potentially coasting out of Africa. And the very simple idea here is that the spread of modern humans out of Africa to the rest of the world could have been particular fast um, and successful if you would just simply follow coastlines. It's a linear stretch of land, right? You're quick, particularly quick. That could explain, for example, this big wave around 60K, why modern humans spread so fast to the rest of the world. Those are kind of like some of the ideas. However, certainly there are also other researchers thinking other, uh, thinking differently about these questions. And there have been several people calling out that we might actually be exaggerating the actual evidence for coastal adaptations in the Pleistocene. And also with that, the relevance of coastal adaptations in our evolution and our dispersal. For example, the team around Nikki Bovin, but also others have said 
that actually the evidence for coastal rotations in early modern humans is very little. So the sample size is really, it's, it's not really good. And at the same time, inland sites are much more prevalent and inland ecosystems are much, much, much more important than the coastlines. This might have to do, for example, as Geoff Bailey has pointed out with the global sea level fluctuations that we actually can't see a lot of the evidence because it's all now um, flooded or it could potentially be, right? And this is kind of like a, a movement against it saying that actually coastal adaptations do not really matter. They're not a big deal. And um, so kind of like when, when I came to the discussion, I thought about, you know, um, are we making, a, so to speak, a, a, a midden out of a molehill um, in terms of ex over exaggerating the actual evidence or is it really a big thing? What is it now? And I think this is at the heart of my contribution day of my presentation to kind of like figure out which camp of those two might be right or whether we actually have to look at this maybe a bit differently even. There's another connected question to that, which I found super interesting. So far, I talk only about Homo sapiens, right? But some people have also claimed, particularly from the Gibraltar evidence, but not just there, that Neanderthals also engaged in the coast lifestyle, so to speak, right? Um, at the same time, though, this got a big backlash from people like Richard Klein, but also Curtis Marion, who claim, no, this is just not true. There's no evidence or no good evidence. This is not correct. Um, I also want to point out that just recently, actually in 2020, last year, um, a team around um, uh, Shua Zulao and, and others have proposed, well, actually, we see a couple of really cool sites like Guata Figuera Brava um, with very good evidence for Neanderthals. I wrote a, a perspective on that with the question, well, is this now the same as we see in Homo sapiens, yes or no? And I think this is also a very important question because if you look at this phenomenon in the Pleistocene, we have to do it from an interspecies perspective, I would argue. So this brings me kind of like, this was a preludium to what I will tell you today in the rest of 25 or 30 minutes. Um, and where I say what we really need, and maybe that's a very German style, but uh, I really think we need to look at the empirical record much more. So in a, more of a less an inductive sense, saying having a systematic review of the evidence and then going on to kind of look or test different theories and questions. And I don't think that has been done a lot of times actually. And I'll put this on the three overarching questions today. The first is the question, well, what is the actual nature of coastal adaptations during the Middle Stone Age, so for early Homo sapiens? First of all, we need to establish that. Then we can look at the question whether um, what potential role these adaptations could have played for the evolution of Homo sapiens. And then finally, in the last step, I also want to compare this then to the Neanderthals and see whether they exhibited similar behaviors, yes or no. And I would always advocate that if we want to answer these large scale questions, we have to work at different scales of research. I mean, the site scale, sure, all archaeological research starts at a specific site, ours as well. But this is not enough. A site does not make a pattern, right? So you need to look at other scales. I particularly will look at the, the continental scale of the African MSA record, but also later at the inter intercontinental record to compare between Eurasian Neanderthals and African modern humans in the MSA. Um, and you can see this is really uh, based or I published several papers on this, which is kind of like um, what uh, kind of like what I did in the last 10 years on this topic is kind of like summarizing all, all of that in one short presentation. So I'll start, as I said, on the lowest scale, namely a site. Um, in 2011, we excavated the site of so-called Hochis Pund 1. It lies on the Western Cape of Southern Africa. What is cool about Hochi's Pund is that, is, as you can see here, it's an open air site. Most often we know uh, coastal adaptations actually from caves, and most MSA sites are cave or rock shelter sites. But this is an open air site, which we excavated 10 years ago. You can see in the bottom left, even myself in the field 10 years ago. Um, in the middle, you can also see Professor Nicholas Connard, who was directing the excavations, excavating there at the site. Um, and if you look also at the background of these pictures, you can see that um, we are directly on the coastline, even nowadays. Um, and so what did we uncover at the site? So as I said, it's an open air site. That's very rare for these kinds of early MSA occurrences. Um, we uncovered three kind of like primary occupation horizons here, age one, two, and three. And all of these featured abundant lithics, fawn remains, okra, and so on, so on in association with one another. And recently this paper is currently in review, but um, more or less accepted. We dated the site to between 130 to 115,000 years before present to, to the Emian interglacial. And this makes the site also the oldest open air shellfish bearing MSA site in the world. So that's also kind of special, which we know now. What do we actually find at the site in a close up? Well, if you look at that, and that's kind of like a, um, the lowest part of the sequence, chess is just um, natural shelly sediment, so that's geogenic. But above that, in the lowest uh, horizon, you can see, you see a couple of these shells, and maybe you can even see a lithic stick out or so, but it's clear that this is not what 
people normally think about it's not a shell mitten so a matrix composed most, mostly of shell but i would call this a shellfish bearing msa side right there are a couple of shellfish and if i go a bit further you can see on the right normally shellfish are in close association with other fawn material for example ostrich eggshells and but also msa lithics and um what Catherine Kiriakou did at the site is what well, she was looking through the, at this from a zoological perspective. And, and she said that, or she found out that what we see at the site is really a pattern of a selective procurement of only a narrow range of shellfish species. You could, can imagine the Atlantic Ocean is the host to many shellfish species, but here people mostly focus on two, Symbola granatina and Corometilis meridionalis, um, and ignore the other ones. Um, she could also show that throughout the sequence, we have repeated several short visits. There's never a big accumulation, but for over a meter of sediment, we have repeated occupations. And she said they're overall systematic and particularly targeted. So they targeted specific species. They not just took everything from the ocean that they theoretically, theoretically could have done. Um, but I also think it's important that all of these, particularly open air sites, but also of these shellfish sites, is that you have to establish a connection between these kind of like different categories of your fauna remains and your lithics, for example, because it could be also natural accumulations. And we did it by various criteria. You can see here, for example, the shellfish should only come from the ecological layers. They should also show signs of human impact. There is fire traces on them, for example. Um, and we have it in close association with other remains like lithics throughout several of the layers at the site. And we can then, after establishing this connection, which I think is really important to have an anthropogenic accumulation of these finds, can put them in a dynamic model of the other evidence, for example, in terms of settlement patterns, which we did then, I'll, which I actually did in my undergraduate thesis. This is, I'll not bore you with the lithic data, um, but this is what I did uh, 10 years ago. Um, what is cool about the site is it features a raw material called silkrete, on which some of the lithics were based on. And this is cool because you can trace it relatively well to various outcrops in the area. And we could do that for some of the silkweed at least. And we found out that silkweed was normally imported from particularly inland sites or inland outcrops where the silkweed outcrops. And then people produced the kind of like tools inland and imported these tools to the coast, which is kind of really cool. So you don't see a lot of like production of the tools themselves at the site, but you see them being brought kind of like to the site. And I'll, I'll skip many other things, but I'll tell you kind of like when we look at the site in a total sense, and like what did we find there? We, would, we did argue that we find a really systematic coast adaptation there already in MS5E, which consists of several elements, for example, this targeted exploitation of shellfish, but also a flexible lithic technology, and particularly this import of the silk tools from inland sites, which to us suggests that the site um, was part of planned coastal settlement shifts, mostly probably for shelf exploitation. The other fauna remains at the site are really meager, not many of them. And I didn't talk about that, but there's also evidence for modified ochre for various technological and or symbolic uses we don't really know. Um, I have to be honest here. We, there is, it's there, it's used, it's modified, but we don't really know what they did with it. And what's important, this kind of package we see throughout all the three layers at the site over a meter of sediment. We now know over about 10 to 12,000 years ago. So it's kind of like really stable and sustained on this landscape. And we actually know many more sites on the Hochespun Peninsula that have more or less the same kind of signal. But as I said, I mean, I, I really like the site Hochi Spund, but it doesn't really matter on a bigger scale because it's just one site, right? What we really need to do to understand the nature of MSA coastal adaptations is to look at the overall evidence. We can do this from in South Africa because South Africa has wonderful evidence both from the Western Cape and its Southern coast. And I just brought you one slide kind of like summarizing this thing. There are these extremely important sites like Pinnacle Point, Blombos Cave, Classis River, Easter Fontaine, and they are important because they show us, give us the oldest, longest, and best known data for human engagement with the coast in Africa, actually. The oldest evidence comes from Pinnacle Point, around 160K, but it runs all the way through to 50K, so for a long duration. And at most of these sites that you see here, you get this complex behavioral package, not just of people using coastal resources, but also engravings on oak or engravings on ostrich eggshell, bone tools, and so on and so on. So many kind of like interesting behaviors all coming together at these sites. I and mean, then some, you might not see this very well, but I, I always put a, a, a figure, um, a picture of the stereographic sequence on. And some of these sites like Clyde's River actually have real shell mitten deposits. So entire layer centimeter thick only of packed shell. So this is really cool. This is also really interesting evidence. But again, this is just South Africa. And uh, I, I promise you, I'll, I'll look at the African evidence, which I did in a review paper two years ago. And um, because ultimately we want to understand Homo sapiens as a taxon, at least in the Pleistocene, 
and in the MSA, so you have to look at the entire evidence. It is there, and there is quite a lot of evidence, actually more than I thought we would find. Well, this is obviously from a literature research. I didn't visit all of these places, but we have good evidence for indications for coast adaptations from at least 28 archaeological sites. Um, from, as you can see on the left map, they come from Northern Africa, some evidence, though not much actually, from the Red Sea. And the best evidence still comes from Southern Africa that I just presented to you from the Indian Atlantic Ocean coasts. Overall, it has a similar duration in other areas in Northern Africa as in Southern Africa, stretching to between 160 to 50k, with most of the evidence falling into marine isotope stage 5. Um, but what I think is important about this pattern already is that it shows us that independent populations engaged with the coast and the oceans. And they did so in different ecological, oceanographic, and geographic backgrounds. And I think that that means something, right? It's not just that the spe speciality of the Atlantic Ocean coast drove coastal rotations. No, they did this at various different kinds of coasts and oceans and so on. There's also, if you look at the SOA archaeological data and the studies that have been done, and there are quite a couple, um, you can see some interesting patterns. Um, first of all, I want to point your um, the view on the picture on the bottom right, where you can see very different kind of stratigraphic sequences. And for example, one is Hochi's Pond and five is Kleisis River. And you can see some of the sites really have just a couple of shellfish in a bigger sediment matrix, but some sites, particularly Kleisis River, but also Blombos, really have some layers that are completely packed by shells. So real shell in deposits with very high MNIs, for example, as well. I mean, at almost all sites, you see a different, a similar kind of abundance of different um, animals that people took out of the ocean. Most always you find shellfish. Um, they're the most abundant remains. You do have a couple of sites, I think seven, eight or nine now, with sea evidence for seals, some scavenging, some active hunting as well. And marine birds like Cape Cormorant, um, for example, and African penguin is used as well. And a couple of sites, four so far, with some evidence for fish. It's not really great so far, but there's at least some. But for the other stuff, particularly for the shellfish, all studies that have been done showed there, there's a systematic and optimized exploitation of these resources, mostly taking the high yield resources from the ocean. <clears throat> However, and that's super important, the question, how large was the proportion of these marine foods actually in the diet? And there's a wonderful paper by Jamie Clark and Andrew Condell where they actually calculate that because you can calculate that. And here's a quote where they say, the caloric contribution from all 10 layers at pinnacle point is 1.5 person days, equivalent to four Cape Dune Morads. And if you know Cape Dune Morads, there's not much flesh on them, right? It's not actually that much. And it's true for most sites, not all of the sites, for most sites they looked at, the shellfish did not play a major dietary role in terms of their simple calories if you compare them to terrestrial animals. Terrestrial animals and their caloric yield were always way higher. And that will be important later for our discussion what the evidence or the impact now of these food items might be. At the same time, you can also compare them diachronically. After the MSA comes the so-called LSA, the later Stone Age. And there are many really cool shell midden deposits from the LSA. And if you compare those two, there are differences. Um, for example, the shellfish densities that you can see in the top right are much lower in the MSA compared to the LSA. There are only few true shell in the MSA. They exist, but they're not many. Um, also, fish and birds are rare in the MSA, not so in the LSA. And um, the mollusk sizes are always much larger in the MSA side. That comes particularly from the work of Richard Klein, which indicates much higher predation pressures in the LSA compared to the MSA. <clears throat> and some people have now interpre interpreted these differences as saying, you know, MSA people didn't have a coast adaptation. But as I said at the beginning, I don't think it helps us to have a black and white kind of scale, but rather I would argue it's a gray scale where MSA people show a, a different degree of adaptedness to coastal niches. So, gradual differences for reasons, for example, of um, um, lesser people, fewer people using these resources or other um, questions. But certainly, I would still argue that MSA people also had coast adaptations in the sense as I defined it at the beginning. Another interesting argument is about uh, the impact of coastal resources on settlement systems. There are a couple of cool studies by the Pinnacle Point team where they modeled sea level changes and site use. And they found that a Pinnacle Point, but also other sites, settlement intensity at these cave sites increased when the sea was closer and decreased as the sea was further away. So a coastal um, point uh, or a coastal location was an important determinant for choosing these sites for habitation. There's also, I showed you Fochi's point, this import of raw materials from inland sources to coastal sites that actually comes from several sites, not just Hochi's Bund. Many sites you get 
high quality raw material being brought from inland sites to the coast, where I would argue this, this, this indicates scheduled coastal visits um, and overall an influence of using coastal resources on overall mobility and settlement patterns of these people that included both inland and coastal sites. <clears throat> And finally, there's also, so far I talked much about mundane uh, things, um, but there's also the non-dietary evidence for the use of shellfish. And um, for example, shell beads as part of necklaces or shell containers as part of orca processing kits. We now have shell beads in the MSA from at least 10 sites in Southern and Northern Africa, most often on the genus Nasarius. Actually, and I just added this this morning because I forgot it. There was just a recent article from Bismune Cave in Morocco that had found even more evidence and even earlier evidence for these shell beads and quite a lot of them. Um, and they now date to between 140K to 70K, so quite a long time stretch as well. They could have been potential identity or group markers that is informed speculation, but at least they exist for sure. And this shows that coastal adaptations encompass more than just filling your tummy, right? It also encompassed the sociocultural and symbolic spheres of these early MSA people to a certain degree, at least. So to sum up, what does this now tell us about the nature of coastal adaptations in MSA modern humans? I would point out four things. First of all, we see the systematic use of variable marine food resources with a focus on shellfish and a methodical integration of these coastal locations in overall settlement systems that consist of inland and coastal sites. This use goes over more than 100,000 years, so it's quite stable and long term. And I would also argue from the presentation uh, from the slides before that there's a verifiable impact on the overall adaptive suit of modern humans. It impacted what they did and, and, and how they lived. What, how can we relate this now to human evolution? Well, for me, in a standard sense of thinking about adaptations and, and, and reproductive fitness, so to speak, my question would be how could coastal adaptations have increased the reproductive fitness of their bearers in relation to populations lacking this trait? That would make them adaptive in a classic gold standard biological sense, right? Um, and basically here, I would first point out that these adaptations were certainly sufficient in their nature and duration to go over many millennia, many generations to have a potential impact on evolutionary trajectories that doesn't prove anything, but it's kind of like the baseline for any further arguments. I think if you really want to relate them, we need much more evolutionary modeling and combining archaeology, ethnography, but also medical and nutritional biochemical studies, right? As I said a bit at the beginning, but I give you one model that we came up with, which is a bit different from the models I showed you before, where we think this would work and one could test this in the future more. This is kind of a combination of the two models I showed you at the beginning of Parkington and Marion, it's a bit different, but it's kind of a combination where we would say that the key thing about coastal adaptations is that they have marine resources as a fallback food with brain selective nutrients. What does it mean? I would say the two cool things about coastal adaptations are one. First, if you have some kind of seafood in your diet as a passive consequence, because it wasn't an intentional choice, you have a higher intake of brain selective nutrients that's good for your health and particularly good for your brain development, particularly in children, and, 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 but also in, um, in pregnant uh, women. But also at the same time, going to the coast right, is an active choice. It's an active choice of going to the coast. And why was that? Maybe it could have been to buffer against food shortages, right? I mean, it could be that particularly in the highly seasonal areas of Northern and Southern Africa, at some points due to drought or whatever, um, you don't get enough terrestrial resources, not enough meat, for example, but you could relocate if you're able to, to the coast and extract resources from there that help you to, to survive through these different difficult times. And if you combine those two lines of evidence, there could be three kind of consequences. The first could be a potential decrease in population level mortality rates because you buffer against food shortages. Um, but also with a higher intake of these um, brain selective nutrients, you would have a higher average number of viable offspring with optimal brain development, because certainly there's phenotypic plasticity in here, but you could fuel your brain, so to speak, with enough of the good stuff um, to make it optimal. And in combination, it could lead also to longer offspring survival that could increase propensity of reproducing so a higher fecundity. This is a very classic standard evolutionary argument. Certainly it's difficult to test, but it's something that I would say is, um, is possible from the evidence I presented you so far. And I'll, I'll be happy to talk about this a bit more later. Um, what about dispersals? How could these MSA coastal adaptations have anything to do with coasting out of Africa? Well, certainly, I would say, from what I showed you, it's clear that humans were capable of efficiently exploiting highly variable coastal niches, right? Northern, Eastern, Southern African coastal niches are quite different. And so that would be good for them, like for humans, like if they go out of Africa, 
um, for unlocking novel corridors for successful and rapid dispersal, potentially again. Um, however, there are a couple of problems with that, right? The Achilles heel of this coastal of Africa still is that we have few coastal sites along these potential pathways out of Africa. They often don't exist. It's not clear whether they were not there or it was whether due to flooding of sea level change. And also not all of these coastlines that you would have out of your way out of Africa are easily traversable. So that's really a problem to this model. Um, I tried to look at this in past from another perspective from ethnographic analogies on how hunter gatherers normally expand into new territories. It's clear looking at that evidence that they use all available routes, but often follow conspicuous landmarks, for example, mountains, rivers, but also coastlines. So I think in the end, I don't think it's either or. I think what happened is that there was a combination of inland and coastal routes out of Africa, but also having this added potential of using coast efficiently might have led to an even more successful demographic expansion along these ecosystems. But that's as far as I would go. What I like also about this idea is that once people are out of Africa and so to speak arrive somewhere else, for example, in Southeast Asia and Australia and the early upper Pacific, when they arrive there, you see that they still engage with marine resources in the settled coast. There are a couple of papers here on the left, for example, on pelagic fishing, but also on the use of nautilus shells, again, for kind of like beads and so on. There's good evidence. And for me, this is a nice combination um, to show where obviously that could have worked. And at least here we have some evidence that it's at the end point, so to speak, of this kind of dispersal. But there is some interesting evidence. All right, coming to my last topic, I talked mostly about Homo sapiens so far. <clears throat> but there was this question whether Neanderthals had the same behaviors as modern humans or not. Now we talked about the behaviors in humans in the MSA. And what I did was in a couple of years ago, I started a systematic literature review where I looked at certain kind of variables the same way for both MSA modern humans and middle Pacific Neanderthals and compared them in this kind of time frame you can see here. Um, this resulted in a quite large database. I looked at over 200 literature resources, um, mostly in English, but also I had to look at my very uh, bad uh, school, French, Spanish, Portuguese, which I didn't have, Italian, and so on. Um, and overall, this database then consisted of 58 archaeological sites with evidence. Um, and I'll run you quickly through what that means in terms of comparison between modern humans on the one side, right, for the MSA in Africa. We talked about that, so I can skip this quite quickly, but also what the same kind of evidence looks for in the underforce and what that might mean. I showed you this um, slide before. So that's the African evidence, 28 coastal archaeological sites, and so on and so on. How does it look like for Neanderthals? Well, actually, a bit more sites. There are a total of 30 coastal sites. Interestingly enough, they also age range from 160 to around 50K, although here most of the evidence comes from marine isotopes age 3. Most of the sites come from the Mediterranean coast, but there are also some from the Portuguese Atlantic coast and the Atlantic Ocean coast. Um, so again, this shows that also Neanderthals were able to use various coastal ecosystems, not just one or so. Um, the problem here being, though, that many of these sites derive from old excavations with few taphonomic studies. So some of these could also be non-anthropogenic use of shellfish. It's not often, uh, sometimes not clear that it's a bit of a caveat here for the Neanderthal sites that I cannot solve at the moment. Um, we can also look at marine subsistence. I showed you this picture before for the MSA modern humans. How does it look like for Neanderthals? Well, it looks a bit different. Um, if you can see the same kind of like abundance scale is there again. So if you see uh, coastal sites with remains of marine foods, it's almost always exclusively shellfish. Um, but the intensity of the use is much lower. So the numbers are lower. As far as I know, there's also no real shell deposit of any Neanderthal site. And the diversity of resources is lower. If you look at the MNIs of, for example, seals or fish, they are super, super, super low. So there's not really a big engagement with these other resources as far as we know. Again, the problem is old excavations and so far, few quantitative zoological studies at these sites. Some Italian sites, some of the Portuguese sites, and some of the Southern Spanish sites are quite good. But many sites just have no good, no good data that I could um, use for this comparison, for example. I haven't shown you this um, for modern humans yet, looking a bit at site use from another perspective, where if you look at many of the coastal MSA sites with evidence for shellfish use, you see there are often long sequences with multiple occupations, all the way, for example, Pinnacle Point, 160 to 90K, but also other sites, so over many long sites. Many of these sites are residential sites that feature high diversity um, and density of finds, as you can see in the bottom left. And again, looking at site use, you have frequent half features and site maintenance behaviors at these sites. 
For the underforest, it looks again a bit different. Um, actually, most of the sites we have are short sequences, often with just a single occupation horizon, and that's it. There are a couple of other examples like Bajondilio Cave, Cota di Mosserini, or Ujazli Cave, where these are actually longer sequences with multiple occupations, but they are more the exception than the rule so far, at least. Figuera Bava one could add to that now. Um, most of the time at these sites, the density and variety of finds is rather low, mostly it's lithics, and nothing else then. And also there's not much evidence for most sites for longer term stays in terms of half features, maintenance, and so on and so on. Also, I showed you this about, you know, um, settlement systems and coastal ecosystems for modern humans. What's interesting about the Neanderthal part is that actually many coastal middle Pacific sites are actually more than I showed you exist but they often don't have any evidence for shell fishing. And that's actually something you normally don't see in the MSA. If you have a coastal site, almost all the time you do have some evidence for at least shell fishing, for example. But what you also see is that almost more than two thirds of the Neanderthal coastal sites show the import of tools from high quality raw materials from inland sources to the ocean. So this again, not just indicates for me at least scheduled coastal visits, but also a, very, a system of very high mobility, higher than for example, the modern humans likely. Um, but certainly this is this is quite interesting. And um, the last point I'll, I'll, I'll compare is um, shell beads and shell tools. As I told you, there's very good evidence for many MSA sites with dozens of shell beads nowadays. For Neanderthals, not so much. There are two sites with potential evidence for shell beads. Um, it's a bit debated, but it could be. But what I find really interesting is that if you look at um, Neanderthal sites, you often see that they used um, shells as tools. So they made scrapers out of shells at at least 13 sites, so quite a lot of sites. And we don't have any evidence for that behavior at modern humans yet. Not, I'm not sure why that is. Maybe people have looked so far for it, but um, let's see whether that pattern still holds up. The question now, after everything I told you, so what is it now? Is it the same or not? Um, do Neanderthals have coastal adaptations? I would argue, yes, they have. Um, because if you compare the entire record, and this is kind of like from this paper where we com uh, compare this evidence then, I would argue that we see more similarities than differences. But there are differences, right? The differences exist. I showed them to you. And I would say they are mostly gradual in nature. So it's not a black and white picture once again, but it's more a gradual picture of modern humans using coasts more intensely, settling more intensely in them and using more marine foods. Um, but we see at least some of these behaviors in a less uh, pronounced sense in Neanderthals. And I think that's, that's, that's important, kind of having this nuanced view on these, uh, of, on these things. Um, there's been some discussion on what could explain differences in modern human and Neanderthal use of uh, coastal ecosystems. It could be global sea level change, although it doesn't really work because global sea level change would have affected both Europe and Africa. Marine productivity could be a thing because some of the African ocean coasts are really high, have really high marine productivity. Um, however, at the same time, if you compare the Mediterranean Sea, you have the North African evidence and the European evidence. In the North African MSA evidence is still much more intense compared to the Neanderthal evidence. I also don't think that discovery and research bias can explain the patterns because actually there was more research done on Neanderthals compared to MSA modern humans in the past 100 years. Um, and I actually think if you would ask me that for MSA modern humans, we have, the, we have only the, the tip of the iceberg when it comes to coastal uh, resource use. So finally, I would argue that the differences can be explained by difference in adaptation or behavioral differences to the coast, for example, more humans or a higher demography or higher population size in Homo sapiens in the MSA, particularly in Southern Africa, but also just a more intense engagement with the coast and more uh, intense settlements at the sites for whatever exact reason. Um, and so coming back to my original kind of like question topic, so what's the big deal in human evolution? Is this now the, the big new thing, the big transformation in our evolution? Well, first of all, I would argue that um, from what I showed you that coastal adaptations are a long-term and widespread phenomenon, both in the Neanderthals and MSA modern humans. So it's not true that there's a really small sample size of these behaviors, but I would put that in a larger perspective. So we know that people have been um, adapting to all kinds of aquatic resources, mostly from rivers and lakes, already in early Homo, there's good evidence for that. And these things are kind of like the next big st step that happens. But for example, real maritime adaptations with boating, fishing, fish hooks, and so on, they happen also a bit later. And I would say that looking at all the evidence I had now is that for me, um, large scale perspective, coastal adaptations are not, you know, this great transformation of human life ways or this great leap forward as some have envisioned. But for me, they rather seem to be a very important add-on 
to the more frequent use of terrestrial niches, because we shouldn't forget most of the evidence still comes from inland sites. There's so much good evidence for hunting of, for example, bovids and so on. Um, and that is even more prevalent in terms of calories, for example, as well. But I would still argue that this is a key and important add-on that kind of like makes this entire package of what it means to be modern human and maybe even what it means to be a Neanderthal. So it's part of a bigger package. It's not unimportant, but it's not this great leap forward. At least I don't see the evidence for that um, from my review of these data. Um, what I found interesting is sometimes I get asked the question, so well, uh, can this even be a big thing, coastal rotations, if you say that, you know, the difference between Neanderthals and modern humans are relatively negligible, and so it couldn't be part of the modern human success, if you want to call it that way later. Um, I would say that's a big and interesting open question, because um, the question begs, like, if you have gradual and small scale differences, they could amount via threshold effects uh, to bigger things down the road. This is completely unstudied, right? I mean, this is not clear. I'm not sure about this. I haven't thought too much about it yet, but I would say it is a very interesting topic for future research to think about what could these gradual differences between species, for example, in coastal rotations mean for the evolutionary trajectories and dispersal capabilities. So coming to my initial point, like do we see, when we look at coastal rotations, do we see a mountain or a midden or a molehill? I would say we are kind of here. <laughs> We're kind of in the middle. I, I think I try to transport that it's not irrelevant or negligible, but it's also not the big thing or big leap forward, I would say. Um, it's part of what made us so flexible about our um, generalist uh, strategies. And I would say it's important to study it more because I think we only have reached the tipping point, uh, the, the, the tip of the iceberg, also in the other force potentially. Now thinking about the new data from Fulgera Brava that was just recently published, an amazing site. So I think there's much more to be done. And instead of ending with, you know, future research, we can talk about this in the Q&A session. I actually want to finish my talk with a quote about the future by Carl Sauer, because I found it interesting when I recently read it, where he says at the end, we still like to go beachcombing, returning for the moment to primitive act and mood. When all the lands will be filled with people and machines, perhaps the last need and observance of man still will be, as it was at his beginning, to come down to experience the sea. And with these concluding remarks, I well, I could thank many institutions and so on, so on, but I think, want to thank two people. I want to point them out, the one being uh, Nicholas Conard, who was instrumental in kind of like putting me on this road for coastal rotations. He threw me in at the deep end, uh, telling me in my undergrad, well, you're going to study this lithic assemblage from South Africa. It was my first time there. And it was successful in the end, but it was a quite an ambitious project. And I, I, I have to thank him for a lot of things. But also John Parkington, who's a, not just a wonderful archaeologist, but also a wonderful person and who has thought a lot, way more than I have, many others, about humans and coasts with some really great ideas and models. And many of the things I think and publish now couldn't have been done without his amazing work. So I want to point him out as well. And I want to thank you all very much and looking forward to your questions. Thank you. That was so interesting. And uh, yeah, loads to think about. Um, so please, could you stop sharing your screen and then we'll go into the um, Q&A. So just a reminder that you can submit your questions via the chat or you can raise your hand. Uh, we do already have one question in the chat, so we can start with that one. Um, so Walter asks, besides muscle, muscle shells, were there findings of fish, fishing tools, sea fish skeletons, boat material and boat material found at coastal sites? A very good question. Um, I'm starting with the easiest one with the fish. Um, it was a surprise to many of the zoo archaeologists when they looked at Middle Stone Age sites that actually they found almost no fish remains. They, the best assemblages come from Blombos, and even there it's not full of the fish remains, it's always clear where there are actually anthropogenic um, accumulations, right? So I would say, so that's the one point. The second point is um, there are no fish hooks in any of the MSA sites so far. That could be a, an issue of preservation for sure, but it's not clear. At other sites in the Paleolithic, you find them, but not here in the MSA. Um, and so my current answer to that would be there wasn't really an engagement with fish, at least not from the sites we have. So I don't think they did that. Funny enough, they did it only, well, only, but a bit later at some of the um, Southeast Asian sites. Um, so the question is, when did these behaviors start? And that is certainly connected with boating or seafaring which is a super complicated question um, because the evidence, for example, in terms of boats is just not there. I'm not sure what is currently all this evidence for boats. Is it still, I think, is it a, a bog find somewhere in Europe? I'm not completely sure on that. I, I, others would know more, but there is no evidence, at least from the MSA, none at all. Um, 
sometimes people have said, well, uh, there's really there's really only stuff on uh, Mediterranean islands, maybe by Neander Falls, that they would have come there by boat, but this evidence is disputed. And, and so I think the earliest good evidence for seafaring might be the, uh, the first people in Australia, maybe, or some of the Southeast Asian evidence, but from the African MSA, none. Uh, thank you very much for that question, Walter. Um, Matthew, do you want to go next? Yeah, thanks for that. And thanks for that talk, Manuel. That was uh, uh, really fantastic. Uh, so I, th I thought of this question when, when you were talking about the, that first site that you discussed, uh, Hojensbund. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'll direct it to that, but happy to like hear your thoughts sort of more broadly. Um, uh, and I guess the question is, uh, from the, I mean, you hinted at uh, there being seasonal movements from inland areas to coastal regions. Is there anything in the data that, that gives us clues as to uh, when people were visiting the coast, like like the types of marine resources they're exporting or the sizes or isotopic data or anything like that? Yeah, also very good question. I think one that we need to look even a lot more into because I think it's super important and interesting. So for example, there is, and I hope I get this correct again, um, in the summer, uh, a lot of these shellfish get really toxic and they have these blooms of toxic uh, tox uh, toxicity. And then you normally cannot, uh, get most of the shellfish out of the sea, right? So it seems that John Parking has also suggested that, that most of the stuff comes from winter months. Um, but um, in MSA sites, we haven't done enough of the isotopes or other studies to confirm that. But for the LSA, there's good evidence for that. And I think that's super important to look at this in more detail, because I would also say that um, what we're not, I would argue, but we don't see so much in the MSA yet is year round settlement of coasts. I rather think there are seasonal movements, most of the time, not for all sites, but most of the sites. And as far as I remember, the North African evidence points to that as well. But unfortunately, we don't have enough studies yet. But I think this is this is something we should definitely do. I, I want completely on your um, on your site. And um, same thing for Neanderthals, because it would be super interesting to kind of pinpoint whether it's really true that um, the stays on coast are just shorter and less, for example, for Neanderthals, and longer times and more frequent for modern humans. And that would be something to have an additional line of evidence other than, you know, relying on, I don't know, density of remains, half features, which all have their own problems with them, right? So I think this is super important and hasn't been done enough yet, at least for the MSA. Thanks so much. Thank you, Matthew. Um, Nida, do you want to go next? Oh, yeah. Thanks very much. I was just wondering if there's any evidence um, in the heart, if you can get extract any DNA evidence about what they might have been cooking on them and and then if there's any evidence of them using or consuming seaweed at all. Well, that's a good question. I haven't thought too much about that, but it's definitely a possibility. The problem with DNA is that so far, the oldest ancient DNA we have from Africa dates to the Holocene. Uh, particularly for humans, uh, right? That's, that's what most focus is. But I think we're now slowly reaching a level where research is trying to push these boundaries. And I, I would predict in the next 10 years, we see much more evidence for ancient DNA in Africa. And um, I think we should do something along those lines, right? To Actually, I would say maybe not just um, DNA, but I would rather go for um, paleoproteomics. So, you know, um, the Zoom studies, the SOA archaeology yeah. by mass spectrometry, right? I think I would rather go that way because it's, it's easier, it's cheaper. Um, and for that, we could, because also there are many just, you know, broken fragmentary remains. And I think we should do much more than that. I'm not sure how far you can really disentangle what was actually cooked, right? Because many of our shells, for example, are burned. But the question is, when did they enter the fire? How did they enter the fire? You could probably look at um, the temperatures of them, how high they were heated. Um, but again, it hasn't been done yet. But it would be an interesting way uh, of future studies. I agree. I mean, there is, I think, because there are not that many sites in the end. And I think we need to get all kind of evidence we can get from these sites. That would be an interesting additional avenue to look at these things. So I think that that's something I have also have to think about. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you very much. Um, so we have a question in the chat from Tim. Um, was there any evidence for terrestrial meat consumption at the South African site? Very good point. <laughs> I completely skipped over that. I've got to be honest. Um, so let's take which side we can take any side. So at all of these sites that are presented, there is also evidence for terrestrial use of particularly bovids. Most of the time, these bovids. And um, I'll not take Hochi's point example because our Zoark data is not so good there. But if you look at the evidence from Blombos or from Pinnacle Point, um, there's 
much more or much more terrestrial stuff than from the ocean particularly if you look at the like i said at the caloric value of them but also just the bones as well i mean there are a couple of layers for example at clysis river where you don't have many bones because it's full of shellfish but normally you get like a sediment matrix and with that you say a couple of stones a couple of fawn remains and even less shellfish so that's why i try to argue that you know you can't forget about the terrestrial stuff it's super important people still hunted these kinds of animals but they also added you know these coast uh, coast resources i would call it a healthy diet right which is diverse um, but for sure they did they did that they had both at these sites yes okay thank you um so we have another question in the chat from cecile i hope i've said your name correctly um could the import of raw material to coastal sites observed in neanderthals be evidence for exchange with inland groups as opposed to high mobility Ah, that's a good point. Um, theoretically, yes, um, that's certainly a possibility. The question would then be, and that's always, you know, in, in the stone, it's difficult to distinguish long range distance mobility, like, you know, people moving somewhere from diffusion to people trading stuff. Um, from the under force, it's super difficult to say. I can tell you that in the upper Pacific of Europe, for example, we often have, for example, shellfish well, but the beauty, beauty shellfish you know like not for food but for other stuff and um, that they travel for hundreds of kilometers inland where it is thought that these were actually traded down the line somewhere which is probably better evidence here for the stones i think i would say it's more likely that it was part of you know like of the the, the let's say monthly foraging round where people really move over the landscape and pick them up kind of like an embedded procurement of livix and then take them to the coast but to prove that, to prove or to distinguish between those two interpretations is not easy. So I think we should keep an open mind to that suggestion. It could be. Um, I, I don't think that it will be, but it, it is an interesting idea. Um, I think we should take this into account and try to think about how to test these with different expectations. Um, but I would say for the moment, there's no other evidence for that, really. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't go for it. Okay, we probably have time for one more question. Um, how far away, uh, so this is from Gabrielle, how far away are the sites from freshwater sources? Are they all close to river mouth? I think it's interesting. Many are, many of the sites are really close to them because yeah, it's a good point. I mean, one of the key resources for all humans is freshwater, right? Particularly if you don't have big storage uh, facilities for them. And um, most of these coastal sites have rivers nearby or other things. Sometimes there could also be groundwater seeping through the through some of the coasts, which you could access. But normally, yes, rivers or deltas or whatever, a mouse are most often close to this river mouth, for example, right? It's in the name as well. Um, most of the, I have to think about Hushispun at the moment, where the next river is. It's not directly across, but a couple, two or three kilometers away. So it's not that far away. So, but it's true that would speak also against staying at sites, at coastal sites where rivers are far away because yeah, you need freshwater at the same time. But most sites have freshwater relatively nearby. So Gabrielle just put in, <laughs> thanks, but doesn't this restrict coastal dispersal? Yeah. <laughs> I agree. I mean, it would. I mean, if you have a, if a, if you would imagine a very long strip of the coast without any potable water near, then yes, this is definitely a restriction. That that's why I would would argue that at many coastlines it works quite well, and many mouths and so on, or, or the rivers are not that far away. But yes, for those where you don't have that, I would also say I can't see you know all the time hominins simply moving along those kinds of coastlines. This is why I this is why this coastal highway doesn't completely work. It works in some areas, but not in others. So it's an important caveat, um, and good that you're pointing that one out. Okay, so we will uh, finish off there. Thank you very much, Manuel, for such an uh, interesting talk. Thank and you. thank you, everybody, for coming. Um, next week, uh, we have our next speaker, which is Dr. Heidi Colloran from uh, Max Planck Institute for Evolution and Anthropology. Um, he'll be talking on cultural evolution and human reproductive dynamics. So hopefully we'll see you all there. So thank you very much again, and um, see you again soon. <laughs> Thank you as well. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.